Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Radical Candor Podcast. I'm Kim Scott. I'm Amy Sandler. Today, we are talking stories. And specifically, why does storytelling matter for leaders? What makes for a good story? And we are going to get some behind-the-scenes stories about Kim's writing of stories. Stories about stories. It's very meta. And really the question is first, why do we need to tell stories at work? Kim, you know, we love stories. Your book is chock full of them. We share our own stories in our workshops and our keynotes, and then we encourage our participants. And of course, all of you, our listeners, to share your stories as well. Stories when you received Radical Candor, what Radical Candor looks like for you, what care personally and challenge directly look like for you. And so I thought I would share uh, a little bit. Uh, there's a piece in first round. Can, can I interrupt oh, you? Sorry. You, Cause, you, cause you, I'm you have a... and you will. <laughs> and you, <laughs> you don't have mind. And you will. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to do that. I want to hear about this, but I, wa- I want to, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I know we talked about doing this episode and I and, and we had a plan, and I want to interject something new that I just thought of just this moment. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to the Kim Scott it. Show. We're just <laughs> riding along by the seat of our pants. Uh, making stuff up as we go along. But I think for leaders, even more important than storytelling is story listening. Mm. Uh, actually, one of my mentors said to me of management, everybody has a story. And one of the wonderful things about being a manager is listening to all those stories. And at the same time, one of the exhausting things is sometimes mm-hmm. listening to all those stories. So anyway, let's keep going. But I just want to like yeah, plant what a that great... seed uh, as we go along. While we're on this, you know, one of the reasons why I really love workshops and I love keynotes where I can actually have a conversation is because there's the structure of a keynote is you're telling every, you're talking for like an hour, right? (laughs) So I'm just curious, Kim, I mean, you do so many keynotes, like where do you feel like the listening comes yeah, I'm up not in that lis- context? I'm not listening too much when I do that. I mean, I'm here, true, truth, story listening is more important. Uh, yeah. And storytelling is actually easier than story listening emotionally. Because it's, it's, um, it's easy to get tired out by other people. So I think that's part of the reason why, frankly, you're, you're pointing out, what, you didn't intend to do this, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to point out my own hypocrisy. I said story listening is more important, and yet I much prefer the storytelling. So well, there you preference go. is different from what we value, yes. and I think sort of the energy that's required. So yes. I don't think you're being hypocritical. I think you're acknowledging sort of the effort that's that's involved. So mindful that we will get to some version of of story listening while we're talking about storytelling. This is from first round. Good leaders are great storytellers are six tips for telling stories that resonate. By the way, we might add a version of um, story listening, our new uh, should we get that URL, storylistening.com? Yeah, storylistening.com. Yeah. So, quote, storytelling isn't just the domain of content creators, marketers, or PR pros. The ability to tell stories that inform, persuade, or inspire supercharges every part of company building. Founders pitching the next big startup idea need to nail the narrative that compels investors to care. Sales reps leading demos have to create scripts that win customers. And they go on to say that stories aren't just for external audiences either. Structuring an all-hands agenda requires telling the story of the company's progress. From making a case for promotion in a performance review, conveying a shared vision for a project, every operator in every function benefits from being able to communicate ideas that connect people, end quote. Kim, what do you think about that? It's very well said. I, I like it a lot. And I will, I will talk about sort of Very, I'll try to get specific about the ways that storytelling were important to me, not not just as a writer, but as a manager when I was Mm -hmm. leading teams. A part of it is that we've talked a a bunch on this podcast about the the get shit done wheel. Mm -hmm. And part of getting stuff done is persuading people. Once you've gone through the listen, clarify, debate, decide... Uh, you've got to persuade everybody that what you've decided is is you know maybe it's not the right decision. You've got to be open to it, but but it's a worth it's worth pursuing anyway. It's worth trying, and 
if we talk about, if we think about persuasion and, and how leaders can persuade their teams to, to try something new or to adopt a certain policy or whatever it is, so persuasion is a big part of leadership. And I want to I wanna revert to Aristotle's <laughs> triangle of, of rhetoric. And uh, and th- there are three parts to persuasion, Aristotle says, and it, this hasn't changed in the last, whatever, 3,000 years since he wrote that. You, you've got to establish your credibility. You've got to share your logic. And then you have to deal with people's emotions. Uh, so credibil- credibility, logic, emotion. I think he calls it, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, my... my uh, my ancient languages are non-existence, but it's logos, bathos, and credo, credos, or something like that. Anyway, we, we'll put that in the. We'll put the proper. We'll put the Latin Arist- or the Greek in the yeah, uh, show we'll notes. Put the Aristotelian terms in the show notes. I, I but, my, my but um, credibil- English major is yeah, a little yeah, bit remiss yeah, here. Yeah, credibility, logic, and emotion is is how I summarize it, and and. If you are going to deal with people's emotions, if you're going to address people's emotions, storytelling is by far the best way to do it. Uh, Because they've done these fMRI studies that show that our brains can literally get on the same wavelength when Mm -hmm. we tell each other stories, when we either tell the story or listen to the story. And, uh, and, And I think that it is... A lot of leaders struggle with that emotional component of of persuasion uh, because it can feel like it can feel manipulative. Mm-hmm. You know, it can feel like it seems like it's easier to manipulate people's emotions than to manipulate the logic. I think that's false. I think plenty of people lie with numbers, uh, but but I think that it's it is an um, an underexplored art of leadership is this storytelling for that for persuasion. But I think storytelling is also really important whenever I was writing performance reviews. So this is another thing that leaders have to do, managers have to do all the time, is write performance reviews. I would put the same post-it on my computer that I put on my computer when I'm writing a novel, which is show, don't tell. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because if you say to someone, you know, something like, you are sloppy. Like, A, that's terrible feedback <laughs> because it's kind of attacks their personality. And B, so it's mean, actually. And B, it's not helpful. It's not going to, and it's not effective. It's not going to change the situation. But if you say, you know, when, when you turn in work that has a lot of spelling errors, you know, you, you undermine your own credibility and, and your report doesn't have the impact it could. Then you know. Then you are going to help someone understand why it matters and specifically what it means. I think very often groups of people tend, when they talk to each other, they tend to reduce things to abstractions, kind of intellectual abstractions, and that is that can be very problematic because. That's often where mis- big miscommunications happen. It's also often sort of a super highway for biases to mm-hmm. creep into our. Mm-hmm. So that's two specific things: when you have yeah. to persuade your team of something, and when you have to do performance reviews. Yeah, those are really helpful. And just to go back to the the first one, the persuade piece, and you also mentioned the get stuff done wheel, and we can put that in the show notes if folks haven't heard those those episodes, we've got a lot of content there. On the persuade piece, and you talked about emotion, there was actually a 1969 research study by psychologists Gordon Bauer and Michael Clark of Stanford, and it showed that participants who listened to a narrative story while learning a series of words had better memory recall than those who didn't listen to a story. And that's become much more, I think, part of the mainstream understanding of the, the, the value that stories have for memory, for recall, for connection. And so much of it is that emotional connection that you are referencing as part of those three pieces of, of Aristotle's credibility, logic, and emotion. And I was reflecting on this. I did this search inside yourself training um, at this point 10 years ago out of Google and one of the ways that we taught about the idea of compassion. So when you think about like, what's the definition of compassion? Well, this, this feeling that arises 
when you're confronted with someone else's suffering and you feel motivated to relieve that suffering. So I've just said some what words. What about of, joy, compassion, and joy? I, I've always wondered the relationship about this. between compassion. No, and joy. No, I mean, or, like, what, it, how do you show your compassion when someone is joyful? Uh, <laughs> well, I think compassion is related to more to suffering, but that's so. You're saying is it only about a relief? There's something about the relieving of suffering that I think goes to the specific, more like clinical, emotional definition of, of compassion. But I, I, wonder, I wonder if there is more research around compassion and joy. Because like, for example, when I tell the story of like walking into the office and one person is having a health crisis and another person is having a, uh, their, their child is in the intensive care mm-hmm. unit. And then the third person has a child who has won the math award in all of New York City. And it was actually the third thing that caused the biggest drain on me, not because joy, you know, not because I, I don't love feeling joy, but because it was like emotional whiplash. But but also because that is I, so I interesting. Think it was really important for me to be able to celebrate with this person. And I think that is, I think that is also part of compassion. Compassion it's not only for negative emotions, it's also for positive emotions. That is so interesting. Yeah. I mean, my the definition I'm certainly familiar with is the difference between compa- compassion. Compassion is really empathy plus action, yeah. right? So, so ruinous empathy is when you are that feeling with and resonating with, but you are not doing anything. And in fact, to, that actually solve causes the problem. harm, right? Yeah. So compassion is, is taking that action with the intention of relieving the suffering. But you can also take an action to give somebody a double bounce in their joy. Yeah. And so I'm so, I I love that idea. And I'm really curious of like compassionate co co celebration. Like you're, yeah, it's like that's a big part of being a manager is is painting a picture of what's possible, is celebrating the wins. Absolutely. Celebratory compassion. It's praise. Like that's why praise is important, actually. It's sort of compassion for, good stuff, not, you know. Yeah. And it's very interesting when we think about words and definitions, like my understanding of the specific definition of compassion is really more about the relieving of suffering. And so I don't, I wonder if there's a way to, to broaden that out to the I mean, definition I'm, I'm, that you're. I'm not going to go much further down the path I'm about to go down, but it's passion with someone, which is more about joy than suffering. Yeah. There you go. We'll stop there. We'll stop there. Well, to <laughs> we will stop there. What I will say is the reason why I was bringing up the example of compassion was because, at least in my previous definition of compassion, before <laughs> we we see, I, I have a totally really, we have rebranded compassion. We have rebranded it. Um, the but simultaneous the, feeling, the simultaneous of co-creation joy. of passion and relief of suffering. Yes, is our new definition. Um, but the but going back to stories, what we did was we would show this video clip, and I don't know how many listeners might be familiar with it. We'll put a link in the show notes. But this came from I think it was in in two thousand three. I might be getting the date wrong, but the Portland Trailblazers coach Maurice Cheeks, who had been a famous NBA basketball player. And it was just before a, an NBA playoff game. So, you know, packed house, this 13-year-old girl goes into the middle of the uh, the court to sing the national anthem, you know, biggest moment of her life. And just a few bars in, she just got overcome by nerves and, and forgot the words. And so she's standing there and starts looking around, you know, panicked. And everyone yeah. is, is you talk about like, we're all feeling that panic as we're our mirror neurons. And Maurice Cheeks goes over and puts an arm around her. And he describes it this way. He said, once I really saw what I did, I couldn't believe I did it. Um, he said, I had to, I'd heard the national anthem so many times. I, I had to know the words. I didn't know I was going to have to sing it, but I knew the words and I had to know I could go out there and help her. I just looked and I knew she was struggling. I am a father. Everyone can understand that. Once I saw it, I didn't want her to be standing in the middle of all those people and not know the words. So I just kind of reacted. I don't even know why. And so it's like this motivation. He's got his arm around yeah. her and he starts singing. And he's a terrible singer, by the way, but that wasn't the point. Like <laughs> he he guided her. And then all of a sudden he got, he was like leading with his arm and then the crowd starts singing in and you're just filled with this, oh my gosh, like what a beautiful moment. And so for me, 
like what a much better, richer, fuller yeah. definition of compassion, at least in my original definition of <laughs> compassion. <laughs> he took um, some action, but he, he took created action. He, crea- he created a lot of joy. And it's interesting, like I think that's for me at least, as as you know, I'm not a huge sports fan. Uh, and so like when I do go to <laughs> sports events. I go as a sociologist, not as a, uh, and not that I am a sociologist. I go as a Slavic literature. I go as an observer. And, uh, and, uh, the thing that I always notice is that to me, sports is about shared emotion and shared joy when your team is winning and shared sorrow when your team is losing. And, and it's, and it's, that's why it's so much more impactful to go in person because there's something really powerful and exhilarating about that kind of shared emotion. So maybe shared emotion is not the right word for compassion, but. Yeah. Well, I, I, of course, while you were talking, I was looking up, up, up compassion and I think it actually broadens out exactly what you're saying. So it says compassion literally means quote, to suffer together. And again, it's defined as the feeling that arises when you're confronted with another's suffering and feel motivated to relieve that suffering. Um, And it talks about- Well, as Ali Ali Love said in in a recent podcast, we get to change the definitions of words. So let's change it. Well, but what I wanted to share, Kim, was that it, it said at the end, this research has shown that when we feel compassion, our heart rate slows down, we secrete the bonding hormone oxytocin and regions of the brain linked to empathy, caregiving, and feelings of pleasure light up, which often results in our wanting to approach and care for other people. So what might be kind of born from relieving the suffering is actually that, that emotional bonding. So, so yeah. what I hear you saying is let's, let's broaden the definition to, um, to sharing all the emotions. Sh- sharing together. the joy. Yeah. Sharing, sharing the, the joy. joy. We, gotta I, share, we, got, we don't have enough shared joy <laughs> right now. I, we got a, a lot of shared anger in our yeah. world and not enough shared yeah. joy. I, I love that. Um, so going back to, you know, what makes for a good story. So we talked about kind of the emotion, the persuasion. You were also talking about the show Don't Tell. And what I think is so interesting is when you think about good feedback, there's really a lot of um, storytelling elements yeah. in that too of like, there's a structure to yeah. how you approach it, context, observation. So so the observation is almost like you're setting the scene with the context and what you observed. And then the result. Um, I'm just curious, like, how do you think about how we construct our our feedback and how that relates to storytelling? Yeah, I mean, I think that a big part of what we're trying to do is to give details that that offer a lot of information, more information than you might imagine. So sometimes when we tell stories, it it, it we all we we sort of dilute the stories with a lot of unnecessary detail, but you can also dilute a story with with uh, abstractions that are not informative. So, for mm-hmm. example, when I was working on a novel, I went one night to the symphony, and I noticed how different people deal with having to walk in front of a bunch of people in a row, you know, in a crowded uh, theater or whatever, and and how people some people stand up and let the person pass, and other people kind of scowl and put their knees aside and other people just do nothing like it's your problem. <laughs> um, and I, and I tried to, I tried to imagine each of the characters in the novel, how they would, how they would, you know, would oh. they apologize a lot or would they just say, get the, you know, get the hell up or, you know, and, and to me, those are the details that like I learned a lot about the characters in my novel by imagining how that they would deal with that situation. That is such a great situation. exercise. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Well, I will say, and you know, part of my joy in doing this episode is because, you know, as a former English major who then after business school went to film school and got an MFA in screenwriting, which I knew eventually would pay off, um, although it wasn't clear <laughs> at the time. But, you know, one of the fun things is like these character sketches and getting into the psychology of it. And what a wonderful exercise of like, what that person would do in that situation. And it's so interesting, Kim, because, you know, we love doing these role plays of how people might receive criticism. That's another kind of interesting um, empathy builder of, you know, how might this person receive the feedback? What might be their interpretation of what's happening for them? I'm curious, like, how much does 
the the sort of fictional character building go into even trying to build some empathy? The, I mean, to me, anyway, the purpose of fiction is to help build our capacity for em- both empathy and compassion. Mm-hmm. And that's why I love to read novels. That's why I actually think if you are a manager, one of the best things you can do in your copious free time is read, no- is read <laughs> novels. I know it's hard to find the time. It's why for me, re- this, is, this is story listening. This is part of story. And mm. it's, it's almost easier to listen to fiction than to real stories of real people. And I think part of the problem for me, uh, part of the reason why I feel it's so draining, which is my problem, not other people's problem, is I feel like when I hear someone's story who's actually telling me the story synchronously, I feel like it is my job to fix it. And I know consciously that it is not my job to fix it, but I have not managed to teach my gut, my stomach, the same thing that my mind knows. And so that, and that, and I can't fix it, you know? So that's part of the reason for, for the, for the burnout with story listening that I sometimes experience. But when I read a novel, I know it's fiction. So I, I don't feel compelled to try to fix the problem. I just try to understand why the person is doing what they're doing, why they're feeling what they're doing. And it's why I love to write novels is because I think it deepens my capacity to get curious, not furious. Yeah. And it's so interesting because as you were talking, you know, one of the things that was coming up for me was the idea of like empathy fatigue and this idea of, you know, identifying so much with the thoughts and feelings of another person. And then again, that distinction where compassion is actually rooted in the desire to help. And I think when you are really resonating with what's happening for that person as they're sharing their story, that is that empathy fatigue of like, you're resonating so much, it actually is exhausting you. Is that, would you say that's what's going on for you or something different? I I think it might be something different. I mean, for me, that kind of like, so the literal... The way that I think very literally about empathy fatigue is if I walk by a pond and someone in the pond is drowning, then I myself can't breathe and I become unable to help them. And so that's like, that, that's about identifying too closely with the person. Mm-hmm. I think what's actually going on for me is that I've moved maybe too far into compassion where I feel like I have to fix the problem. And, and the, the need to fix the problem prevents me from listening. It creates attention, you know? And so there's like, there's something about feeling and acting. There's a space, kind mm-hmm. of a liminal space between, yeah. between feeling and acting that, that allows us to keep listening and keep understanding. And, and I think that can be hard like hard for a lot of people. I mean, I know I certainly struggle with it. I struggle with it with my kids. I struggle with it with, with my husband all the time. They come, bring something to me that's upsetting them and I want it to go away uh, because like, I don't like to suffer myself, but even less do I like to see the mm-hmm. people who I, to notice that the people who I love are suffering. Like that's even harder for me than my own suffering. And I think I'm not alone. I think a lot of people feel, yeah. the, same, feel the same way. It's really touching. And I'm just curious, like, has writing been an outlet for you to help transform some of that feeling of overwhelm? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because when I'm writing, I can slow the world down and and stay in that liminal space where I'm really trying to understand before I'm trying to fix. I mean, obviously you have to understand a problem before you can fix it. <laughs> and yet that that period where we're trying to understand a problem that we want to fix, but we don't yet understand, so we can't fix it. That is a hard space to be. Yeah. And I can see, you know, and certainly as a manager, um, you know, you, you've you said that story of how you've sort of walked through the office. And it's interesting because you you had a conversation with someone and you're processing that, and then you didn't really have time to sort of fix it or address it because then the next person comes to you and then the next person. And so now you're like carrying around this basket of of emotional um, taxes. I want to go back, Kim, to what you were saying of the value of storytelling for managers, for leaders. And there was a Harvard Business Review piece uh, where they, they were talking about five types of stories for leaders. And one was vision stories. So you inspire a shared vision value stories where you're 
sort of articulating the values of the organization, action stories that are about sparking progress and change, teaching stories, we do a lot of that, that transmit knowledge and skills to others, and then trust stories, uh, which help people understand, connect with, and believe in you. And I think that's, you know, when we talk about sharing your radical candor story, there's a lot about that vulnerability, that shared, you know, sense of, hey, I'm going to make a mistake. You tell me, and I'm sort of modeling that trust. But what do you think about that sort of vision and values and action teaching trust as a frame? Yeah, it's it's an interesting frame. I like it. I think for vision stories, it's really important that leaders are listening to other people's vision stories and not trying to impose their vision on the organization. And we've talked about this a couple of times, but I think there's this tendency, especially in business right now, where CEOs are almost taking the place of moral leaders that have mm. existed in the past, uh, not taking the place, but pe- people tend to look to them to have the answers. And I think the more often leaders can say, I don't have all the answers, you all, but like, they're not training people. They're not pushing something into their team. They're pulling, they're educating, they're pulling greatness out of their team. And that means that I, it's not my job to tell you what the vision is. It's my job to listen to what you understand the vision to be and to help people come to a shared understanding of the vision, but not to impose the vision on the team. It's a little bit like that Christopher Wren story that we've talked about before, where Christopher Wren was an architect after the Great Fire of London, and they're rebuilding the cathedral, some cathedral, I forgot which one, and he's walking around, and one person says, I'm laying bricks, and another person says, I'm building a wall, and the third person says, I'm building a cathedral to the Almighty. And I think it's really, I think very often when people hear that story, they mistake the leader's job is to grab onto that glorious vision of I'm building a cathedral to the almighty. And I think that's wrong because if people, you know, if some of the builders were atheists, then building a cathedral to the almighty Mm. doesn't have any meaning for them, but building a wall might give a great deal of satisfaction. So I think vision stories are important, but listening to other people's visions is more important for a leader than to present a vision. I love that. You know, it really relates to career conversations and understanding what motivates people. And even when we think about rock star, like where are you in your growth trajectory that right now, the feeling that I did a a good day's work lifting heavy things to build this, you know, this wall wall felt satisfying. And so I think understanding that, um, how how what I am doing might also contribute to a broader vision is helpful, but my specific piece of it is really up to me to make the meaning for myself. Yeah. And I think the same with value stories. I mean, it's really important to articulate what your values are and to live them, not to be hypocritical. But it's also important to under to, to give your whole your whole team the opportunity to show how they are living the values. Because you know, we can, again, this goes back to the problem of abstractions. We can say it's really important to tell the truth, but what, you know, different people have different interpretations of what the Mm -hmm. truth is. And so it's really important to create uh, a shared storytelling. There's not one storyteller to create a platform for, for the team to share their stories about what the values are so that 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 will help us, you know, going back to that fMRI study, that will help mm-hmm. us get on the same page about what these values mean. Because what one person means by love, it may be very different from what another person means by love, even though we all say love is important. What one person means by truth may be different from what another person means by truth. And it's important to understand that we we need to get on the same page about what these values are. Integrity, like like what yeah. what organization has said, oh, integrity is not important to us. <laughs> and uh, and and yet that you know, there's a lot of organizations that are not living with integrity. So telling stories and getting the organization telling each other's stories is yeah. really important. I mean, that's that. one of my favorite things in our workshops is hearing folks share their stories of what radical candor looks like for them, because in their own words, that will, you know, we can say care personally and challenge directly, but 
to your point, show, don't tell. What does that look like for you specifically? And what does that tell me about Kim? If I know that Kim, that efficiency is important for Kim, the best way I can care personally is to make sure that I end this podcast (laughs) on time so that you can get to where you need. Like that is an act of showing that I understand what's important to you. Yeah. And so just to go into what makes for a good story, you talked about the, the three pieces from Aristotle, just to go back to to that. By first, the way, so yeah. Aristotle was not talking about storytelling. He was talking about persuasion. So, and that's a credibility, logic, and mm-hmm. emotion. And I think storytelling is an important aspect, can be an important aspect gotcha. on the on the emotion part of 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 telling stories. I mean, for me, a good story is is all is boils down to show don't tell it boils down to sharing these details that paint a picture of who the person is and why what matters to them matters to them and it is amazing i mean when i go back even to i think the, probably the first thing i read in film school for, was from aristotle and, and mm-hmm. the the three act structure beginning yeah. middle end yes. you know if you look yeah. at any even in the briefest TikTok, you know, 10 second piece, there's going to be beginning, middle and end. And so yeah. just to go back to show, don't tell the first round um, story. And I, I'm curious, as you think about show, don't tell, they had three pieces, three essential elements in a great story in that, in that first round piece. One, your through line that connects everything together, the point of you telling the story in the place. So maybe kind of your why for showing, not telling. Two, put me in the room, anecdotes that provide a tactile sense of experience, take your audience on a journey, create drama. Three, moments of reflection, telling your audience how you feel in order to cue them to feel a certain way. And that might even go somewhat with um, more the persuasion part of it, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And so actually- that one is bringing up, Kim, I feel like there was a story you told about emotion where it was like the person, there was a maybe an engineer and it was like, he had a lot of strong emotion about something, but you said, it's like, oh, it's about emotion. It was like, not oh, about yeah, this yeah. Is your emotion, but how is the audience? <laughs> yeah. How is it connecting to the emotions of, of the audience? Yeah, this was an engineer who was working at a big tech company that builds a lot of products that we all use every single day. <laughs> And he was working on making this product more accessible for people who are hearing impaired. And his mother was hearing impaired. So he cared very deeply about what he was working on and very personally about it. And, uh, and he came to me and he said, I could not feel any more strongly about this, but that did not help me persuade these engineers to build this feature. And, and then I said, well, ha- how did the engineers feel about it? And he was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and the way they felt was they were stressed, they were busy, they were working too much, they weren't getting enough sleep. And now they felt guilty that they weren't working on this thing. And sometimes when we feel guilty or ashamed, we just shut down. And, uh, and that was kind of what, what happened. And when he went in and he, uh, he showed more compassion for the way that they were feeling, it was easier for him to persuade them to build this thing. Yeah. I mean, going back to really knowing your audience and there was something interesting. There was a podcast, uh, the Think Fast, Talk Smart podcast with Matt Abrams, who I know we've mentioned before. David Eagleman shared, my audience is me when I was much younger and didn't know whether it's that word or a piece of jargon. One of the tips was don't use jargon. I think it goes also to show, don't tell. Integrity, yeah. you know, yeah. what is, like, but this idea, my audience is me when I was much younger and didn't know that word or that piece of jargon, I think is such an interesting yes. way to think about um, how do you show and not tell? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't know that jargon. I mean, you also didn't know, gosh, when I was younger, there's so many things that I wish I knew <laughs> what, that I had known when I was younger you know, and now that I have kids who are 14, it's like, I want to tell them all these. And they, it's like, it's not <laughs> helpful to tell them all these things. <laughs> they don't want to know. Uh, and they got to, they want to figure it out themselves. And so it is, but I, I love that framing. I mean, that is why I write. When I'm writing, I'm writing. I'm, I mean, I hope that I'm not so um, sort of egotistical that I'm only writing for myself. But I do feel like the audience I know best is my younger self. So I'm often. Yeah. And I mean, I think, look, going back to like, we can't, 
the more specific you can be towards that younger self, you know, there that is where the universality comes from, right? In that yeah. specificity. So going back to your own writing process and part of what sparked this conversation was you mentioned recently on a podcast that uh, you said that, you know, you had written these novels and you started writing this nonfiction book about management advice and you were writing it for yourself and you, yeah. you didn't actually intend to publish it. So I'm just so curious, like what made you decide to try to publish it? You know, I, I was just, it's funny. I was just thinking about this this morning. I was, a friend of mine's husband died and a bunch of uh, our friends had flown in for the funeral and they didn't want to stay in a hotel. So we, I had a lot of people staying at, at, at my house, um, sleeping on couches. <laughs> and we were at breakfast and one of the women who had flown in from D.C., said, oh, I have this friend who's an agent. You should really send, and she had to really talk me into doing it. You should really send him this book because it seems like it would be helpful for a lot of other people. And, uh, you know, and I was kind of discouraged because I had written these other novels and they had a stack of rejections. And, and the reason for the rejections was always the same. The main character, who was always me, doesn't seem very likable, you know, so it's kind of <laughs> especially painful rejections. But she persuaded me to send this to Howard Yoon, who became my agent, who I'm very grateful to because he like read the thing in 24 hours and he said, we can sell this. We can absolutely sell this book. Uh, and then he took me to meet a bunch of different editors. And I met Tim Bartlett, who uh, has been my partner in crime ever since, who I talk to probably once a day, who, uh, who has just been such a wonderful person in my life. And, so very grateful to Tim and St. Martin's Press and and to Howard. Never would and and to Kim Keating, who made me send the book to Howard. You know, I loved hearing that. I've never heard that. And just acknowledging even from this, you know, tragic situation of your friend losing their spouse and and the people coming together and this idea of how we support each other and the value of sharing stories and that people actually want and can learn from sharing our stories. And so often we think, oh, well, I'm just doing this for me. And, you know, people don't realize what an impact they can have and how often the value of feedback, again, going back to the importance of praise, is realizing like, oh, you're doing so, like, no, I want more of this. Like, this is yeah. actually really helpful, right? So yeah. I just, I, I love that um, that you got that encouragement and that it, the relationships continue. And I'm, I'm curious, the stories that you chose to share in Radical Candor, like as they were happening, were you aware that these were like, oh my gosh, like this is a great story? Or was it like only as you looked back on them that you're like, oh, this is kind of teaching me something about management? Like how were you making sense of those stories? I mean, at the time, I didn't. I didn't think of them as stories. I thought of them as my as <laughs> my life. Moments. Yeah, painful. <laughs> Although I will say, when I was living in Moscow, and like really remarkably strange things were happening on a daily basis, I did think of those things as stories. And maybe I developed the habit for storyifying my life as I was going through it when 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 I was living in in Russia. But uh, but I think as I was writing the book. And, and there was this little post-it on my computer that said, show, don't tell. I kept trying to think of specific examples. And it wasn't clear to me, even as I was writing the book, whether the examples I was choosing were any good. I mean, I think I've probably told the um story 5,000 times. Uh, and so I apologize if you're listening and you haven't heard the um story. <laughs> You can. You might. Start, you might go, find go, it go, one or go two Google places it. on the uh, internet. But I think most people who are listening to the podcast have probably heard that story. And, and I almost, in fact, I did delete that story from the book at one point. Oh I my thought, gosh! I thought, you know, this is kind of boring. Like, who really cares? And I told this other story that was much more dramatic. And Tim Bartlett, who I mentioned, called me up and he's like, "The um story was way better," you know. <laughs> uh, Yes, I agree. This other one is sort of cooler, but we're not going for cool. We're going for relatability here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there you go. You want to hear the other story? Oh my gosh. I, I, I mean, I was going to ask, so thank goodness. So the other story was, um, I was, uh, this was when I was <laughs> managing the AdSense team and I had just watched 
what was the, the, there was a documentary about Al Jazeera called like the control room or something. I can't remember what it was called. It was a great documentary. We'll look it up and drop it into the show notes. And Al Jazeera was in the Google content network. And there was a policy against controversial content or something like that. And so somebody had had uh, taken Al Jazeera out of the Google content network. And I thought this was wrong. I was enraged about it because, <laughs> because I had just watched this movie talk about stories impacting. And so I reinstated them. <laughs> Single. This was. This would not happen today, at Google. There are more controls, but this was like back pre IPO, Google, and so I reinstated them sort of unilaterally. And then my my boss got very angry with me, and she said, "You you shouldn't have done that. The advertisers are not going to be happy. It's going to cost us money." And I kind of got on my high horse, and I was like, <laughs> "Well, you know, Al Jazeera is real, and and I, like I was right about like I do think Al Jazeera is a great news outlet. I want to say that. As it turned out, it wasn't actually Al Jazeera that was part of the content. It was like some somebody, somebody posing as Al Jazeera. So that's another. But I didn't know that at the time because I wasn't getting into the details. I was so up <laughs> high on my high horse. And uh, and the next thing I knew. Wells Fargo um, was angry, had pulled like $400,000 worth of advertising out of, the, uh, out of the content network because Osama bin Laden had, there was something on this thing that wasn't actually Al Jazeera of Osama bin Laden saying, where do you get your credit? Which triggered these <laughs> Wells Fargo <laughs> It's all funny now. I hope I'm not getting in trouble for revealing all we this. We might need I'm to edit. Sorry, <laughs> Wells Fargo. It's okay. Uh, I think it's, it's long in the past. Uh, and so, like, and, and Google was just about to go public, so revenue really oh mattered, my gosh. you know. Yeah. And it was a lot of ad dollars they had pulled out of out of. Uh, and and so then I was really in a lot of trouble, you know. And uh, and I got some radical candor that was, you know, along the lines of, if you would get off your high horse and look into the detail, like, I, I thought I was going to get fired. Um, and then I, and then I, so then I did, uh, I, I made the change. And, but meanwhile, the whole company had gotten up on its high. I had gotten not just myself, I had rabble rouse. There, there was were hundreds, there was an army of high horses. Yes, there was an I had I had called in the cavalry yeah. of high horses. And so I had to not only take this publisher that was pretending to be Al Jazeera but wasn't actually Al Jazeera out of the content network. I had to explain to everybody why and calm the whole situation down. Oh my and gosh. I, and I wrote this email. My boss, who had just really yelled at me, called me in and she was like, that was the best email I've ever seen. You did a great job, you know. So it was like it was. Oh I thought gosh. it was a good. It was a good story, but it's way harder to explain than the. Um, the but I have story. to say, Kim, I have never seen you so engaged <laughs> in telling a story as I. <laughs> That That's one. Maybe I should tell some. I new think we stories. might. Need, yeah, <laughs> it was fun for you to tell that. I love listening, and now we are going to leave this as maybe a a double parter because I have some questions. I want to know what was in that email that made it so great because I do think that's a real skill and there is a value in storytelling and persuasion. Like what, what did you have in that, in that email? I, I understood what, what my boss did not understand. I understood and, com and had real compassion for the emotions that, that had caused everybody to jump up on their high horses. Mm. And then I used, it was credibility, credibility, logic, and emotion. I had credibility because I was on their side. Uh, I explained the logic of why I had done, and then I explained, you know, why I thought it was the right thing to do despite all of, all of the emotions. Well, I think that's a great way to close us out. Uh, Kim, you are writing a new book. Yes. And can we have a follow-up conversation to hear more yeah. about that book? Yeah, we can talk more about, let's talk about fiction in a follow-up. Okay, fiction in a follow-up. It's, it's a utopian novel in which we have fixed everything. Oh, talk about compassionate joy co-creation, <laughs> rewriting the yes. words. Um, yes. I'm all, I'm all for that. All right, so now it's time for our Radical Candor checklist. And these are tips to start putting Radical Candor into practice. Tip number one. Tell stories. And when you tell your stories, show, don't tell. Don't allow yourself to get into kind of sloppy abstractions. 
think very specifically about the situation and why it mattered. Tip number two, just as important, if not more important than storytelling, especially if you're a leader, is story listening. We all have our own unique, specific stories to tell. And the best way to understand your company's vision, your company's values is through the words, behaviors, and passions. Dare I say passions of yeah. your employees? Yeah, it's okay. We, we all have passions. We all have passions. By the way, can I add a, t- uh, a sub tip on your sub tip, tip of story listening? Yes. Read novels. Since it was actually your, your yes. tip. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm not following very well today. I'm not following instructions. I got a bad grade on Kim follows instructions in kindergarten. And that <laughs> well, look is, where it got you. That is some feedback that I have not managed to address <laughs> to this day. Anyway, so I think it's really important to read novels. And I'm going to, we're, we're going to put in the show notes a list of my favorite novels. I have some, I have an assignment. Jason told me we shouldn't publish this without me explaining why these are my favorite novels. I haven't had time to do that, but we're just going to list them for now. Oh, well, no, that's perfect because we said we were going to talk about fiction. So we'll talk about why these are your favorite novels. Yeah. Okay, so we perfect. have a follow up. Do you want to do that third tip since you don't like yes. to follow instructions? Will you still follow that instruction? Uh, I'll, I'll, I will do it. When you ask me, Amy, I'll do it. Oh, anything. that's so nice. All right. Tip number three, in order to make sure that your persuasion is persuasive, follow Aristotle's simple credibility, logic, emotion. Make sure you're explaining why you have credibility, that you're sharing your logic, and most importantly, that you're addressing the emotions of other people, not your own emotions, other people's emotions. For more tips, you can go to RadicalCandor.com slash resources. Go ahead, download our free learning guide. Sign up for Radical Candor on Masterclass. Get our lit video book or register for our workplace comedy series, The Feedback Loop, and so much more. Show notes for this episode, go over to RadicalCandor.com slash podcast. Praise in public and private. Criticize in private. If you like what you hear, go ahead, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And If you've got criticism for us, kind and clear criticism, go ahead, email it, podcast at RadicalCandor.com. We also love hearing your stories. Bye for now. The Radical Candor podcast is based on the book, Radical Candor, Be a Kick-Ass Boss Without Losing Your Humanity by Kim Scott. Episodes are written and produced by Brandy Neal with script editing by me, Amy Sandler. The show features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff and is hosted by me, still Amy Sandler. Nick Carissimi is our audio engineer. The Radical Candor podcast theme music was composed by Cliff Goldmacher. Follow us on LinkedIn, Radical Candor the Company, and visit us at RadicalCandor.com. 